for going through. And with that, uh, Andrew Fong. See if this works. Okay, there we go. Thank you for having me today. It's amazing to be here in person. Um, it's been a, I think I've done one or two talks since we've been doing more in-person events. Um, and I also want to say thank you for spending the time here today, because I know time is a really valuable and it's a big time commitment to come to a conference um, and spend time listening to us talk. So thank you for that. Um, so this is a rough agenda. I'm going to give a kind of an overview of why I'm here. Why do I care about this problem? Um, what hypergrowth is like, uh, who's been through hypergrowth, and I'll start there, who's going through, through the exponential curve, say one or two people, I'll kind of give an overview of that. Um, and then some of the lessons we learned, and one of the reasons I really like this is that hypergrowth gives you a really con condensed view of the world, and you can kind of extract some principles and kind of foreshadow that foreshadow where everything else is going. And then kind of wrapping it up, why, what these lessons taught us about intent-based deployments. This is me. I currently am a founder and CEO of an early stage startup. Uh, we are working on problems around production, specifically starting with deployments, but really our end goal is to make platform engineering teams be forced, forced multipliers. It's something I feel really passionate about. Um, I've spent probably the last 22 plus years in infrastructure, maybe 25 years in infrastructure. Um, I've seen a lot of things, I guess, over the years. And across these three eras of sort of the internet that I've seen, there's been one constant. Um, I, this room is big, but uh, anyone want to venture a guess as to like what's the, just you can shout it out, like what one constant over the last, you know, say 20, 25 years of the internet has been? Anybody? Nobody? Yep. Growth? Okay. Good, 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 good guess. Bugs? Things break? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll go with something even uh, more fundamental, um, interns. Um, so I, I'm actually here today because uh, of interns. In 2016, I was running the production side of Dropbox. And I, it spent, I spent almost a decade there. But at that time, I had focused on reliability and cost. And I remember at the time our head of cloud engineering asked me, he said, hey, Andrew, can you spend some time and talk to the rest of engineering? Just like figure out what's going on. I want to understand what problems there are because we were really focused on getting gross margins down. And I spent some time just like walking around engineering, talking to engineering directors. And it was amazing. I, it was actually more like a gut punch. I shouldn't say amazing because what's going to come next is kind of terrifying. Three engineering directors told me that they had interns and their one-on-ones crying. And a fourth one told me that a staff engineer that we had just hired quit after three weeks. And the common theme around this was that this idea of developer effectiveness, this idea of getting things to be super simple and lowering the cognitive overhead, it wasn't there. And for me, that was sort of like, like just light bulb moment. Like, this is what, what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do from now on. It's going to be what I work on, whether it's at Dropbox, whether it's at a startup as a CTO, whether it's founding a company. Um, and I sort of, I, I spent a ton of time just sort of soul searching to figure out, okay, what is, what is that thing? Um, and it really, that moment, when, like listening to this problem with an intern's crying, solidified that for me and said, okay, this is why we do DevOps, this is why we do infrastructure, this is why we do platforms. It's because there's someone on the other side of that. It could be an intern, it could be a staff engineer, but they're trying to do their best work. And in this case, we are an impedance to that. And for me, that was sort of an untenable situation. That's, that's why I'm here. I think you're here to hear about hypergrowth and what it's like to do this in hypergrowth. Um, it's a great learning experience. Uh, I was at YouTube in 2008 through 2012, um, and this is kind of the growth curve that we, we looked at there. It, it's kind of crazy how fast and how many users were adopting the platform at the time. Um, and I had started my career in, at AOL and was spending time in video, and the reason I joined YouTube was because I wanted to watch The Daily Show whenever I wanted to watch The Daily Show. It's actually the reason. Um, YouTube, or AOL was not making enough progress to that, despite the fact they had Time Warner, and YouTube seemed to be a better bet for like watching The Daily Show whenever I wanted to. Um, so I joined YouTube uh, and saw it grow through about, I don't know, some sub-billion users to like almost a billion. Um, and at the time, we were taking on 24 hours of video every minute. That's, that number in terms of scale is uh, in a day we would take 
we would upload, more uploaded video in one day than the entirety of Hollywood down the street would produce in its entire existence. Um, and this is roughly 2010. So you can imagine sort of the scale they operate today. And so we had to solve a lot of problems. Like the tech that exists today didn't exist then, right? Like a lot of the things that we were, had to build and had the problems we had to solve, we had to do them with a very much more rudimentary set of tools, which we're gonna talk through, but why they can sort of mirror where we're going with the world today. At Dropbox, this is kind of the growth curve there. This is the growth curve there. I joined 2012 and was there through 2020. Um, we went from about 50 million users to 700 million users, so another humanity scale product. The, and we doubled our infrastructure every year. And when I say doubled our infrastructure, I think I, when I joined we had about 400 databases. When I left, we probably had between 12 and 15,000 databases. Um, and keep in mind hard drives are getting bigger and computers are getting faster, so like some of this density is compressing. Um, we were building, you know, to support the system, things, we were doing things like the database storage systems had to, they were fully consistent, um, sub 10 milliseconds sort of write latencies with cross shard transactions at that scale as well. Um, and so we were building systems to handle that. Um, but the system I think that taught us the most was a storage system. And so it's a storage system that started with zero bytes on disk. And over the course of a very short period of time, we moved one exabyte of storage out of S3 to our own infrastructure. And we did that in 24 months. This is, and when I say we did this in 24 months, this is turning up data centers domestically, building an international backbone at a terabit scale, um, qualifying and developing hardware for servers. Um, what else did we have to do? We had to build a storage stack. We, we started with zero code and we actually built a storage stack that is geographically redundant, uh, has over 29s of durability. And that was in 24 months. And so there's a lot of lessons there that we had, we looked at and we said like, okay, what, how would we look back and did this again? What would we do differently, right? Because we were seeing that, okay, there's a cloud thing happening here. There's a lot of things we have to extract from this. And so for me, the reason I enjoy hypergrowth is this is sort of what the normal organization's lifespan looks like. You have this like very long, you know, multi-year, you get to iterate. You know, you have, who here has like quarterly planning cycles that last forever and like really the next one qu quarterly, I can see a lot of heads nodding. <laughs> one quarterly planning cycle goes to the next quarterly planning cycle. You can't move an exabyte of data um, in 24 months if you kind of go through that. You have a process that looks way more like this um, and you just basically try to fix the problem as it comes up. Uh, and so that, that was, that's what hypergrowth feels like. It feels like this sort of constant hamster wheel you're always on. Um, it's unlike anything else I've experienced in sort of engineering. But I think it's a good segue over to what we think about as the foundation. And I think I like this because this is where I think the world is today. We're spending a lot of time on this foundational thing, on the foundational infrastructure. We're thinking a lot of around, you know, IAC, infrastructure, infrastructure as code, all of the baseline cloud provisioning infrastructure is where, where things are today. We haven't even got to the application layer, which is like the back half of this talk. But in 2008, I think like to use this as like, let's reflect. We said that this is kind of like what we wanted. We wanted something repeatable because we were gonna operate at global scale. We needed to be pool based um, because we knew that we were gonna have things offline, online. We couldn't just rely on a push based model and make sure everything's gonna get out there. It had to be in code. Um, we just said like it's, there, by the way, the infrastructure teams at both YouTube and Dropbox when I joined were 10 people. Um, and they were, I think only were about 150-ish, well, Dropbox is about 150 now. Um, so they're still very small relative to the infrastructure they support. So it has to be in code, it has to be reliable, I have a typo, um, and it has to scale. This is what we did. <laughs> we had a shell script that ran every five minutes uh, with some splay on every single server, thousands of them. And it would sync down all the things that we needed to have synced to the servers, and like all the infrastructure layer pieces. We would update them. We had a little CF engine in there, but very, very little, just basically because it <coughs> understood how to change like sys syscuttles. Um, and then to deploy code, we would literally run HD pool on every single machine, like tens of thousands of them. Because um, this is pool based, right? <laughs> like, this, they're all gonna sync to themselves and it's gonna be consistent. And then we ran everything under Monit. This supported and ran for us for a very long time. Tens of thousands of machines, daily deployments, hundreds of engineers, four nines of reliability, and products at scale, humanity scale, right? And so there's a lesson here, right? There's, we look at those three commands and we see what did they turn into today, they look more like this. 
They do exactly the same thing. <laughs> There's nothing here besides we've just up-leveled this a little bit and given a little bit better interface to things, made it a little bit cleaner, because now we're supporting, you know, there's lots more people using these type of tools. But um, we're in a world today where what we, the principle here is like infrastructure code is good, right? Like this is a good pattern. This pattern actually will scale, and so if you're adopting this pattern, I'd say continue adopting this pattern. Don't, don't, don't think there's another way of doing this and there's a better way of doing it. Probably for the next five to 10, 15 years, this is actually the pattern that should be there. Um, and it's a very reliable pattern. So I want to start, I'm like, to, like to frame this presentation with that, because you know, I'm not here to say like, there's another way of doing it. No, we're just catching up to where some of these like, large scale infrastructures were, um, because there's a lot of crossover between where we were 10 years ago to what people are deploying in the public clouds today. So with that, I'm gonna transition over to operating in the cloud. What did we learn there? Is I think this is where it gets interesting, because I think most organizations, if I think about the timeline of this, probably five, who's done a cloud migration in the last five years? Okay, last 10 years? Some, okay. Who's not yet done a cloud migration? Okay, so like third, is like, okay. Um, this will be useful for all, I think all, cl all classes of this. Who's, who's building cloud native applications that have never done anything not in the cloud and are doing like everything correctly in the cloud today? Anybody? One or two, okay. Um, so YouTube was a bare metal data center. It was its own cloud, and it looked very similar to all the types of apps you would see today. Batches, batch systems, databases, caching, there's nothing special here. It is literally a formally aligned Python application at the time. Um, every single one of these things, by the way, runs the same code base, there is nothing special. We just took the entirety of the Python code tree and put it on every server, and we would just use a different entry point. Sounds very similar to Docker, like if, in some ways. Um, and then we had various like subsystems that read only the index servers or only the in search like interface. But very similar to what people do today, <laughs> we get acquired, right? And these guys show up, right? And now we have two clouds. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, what do I do? And one of these is really good at a certain set of things. Probably you, if you do multi-cloud, my guess is it's not for reliability, it's because there's a capability in another cloud that you like better than the cloud you're in. Um, I'm seeing a lot of heads nod. That's exactly the case here, right? So we can now map exactly what's happening today back to what was happening 10 years ago. Um, they're really good at storing lots of data. They also are really good at serving lots of very small thumbnails. By the way, that's a very hard problem. If you've ever tried to build a thumbnail system at YouTube scale, it is like one of the hardest problems in the world. Um, they're very good at that and they can like scale horizontally forever effectively. Um, and so what we learned is like, okay, we've gotta build a tool chain now that supports both of these. Now the problem is this. This is the tool chain that we were running at YouTube, which is also very similar to the Dropbox tool chain. It was a SPN up instead of um, uh, HG up. Um, and we just used system D instead. This became a problem. This is actually the biggest problem of like multi-cloud management for us is the tool chains were just so drastically different and there was no good crossover of the tool chains. And I'm guessing if you're in Amazon and Google and you're like, I've got G Cloud and I've got AWS CLI, they look very different. Terraform makes it a little better, but like it's not great because not everything I'm guessing is Terraform and it's just a pain to manage these things. Well, that was the same for us. We had to learn just about every single command there's possible at Google to make this work. And we had to go all the way down to the left, bare metal um, in some cases. And so we had to learn how to create storage, create storage systems. It's like, it was a big pain to deal with this. Um, I left before we had to resolve this problem. And I think that actually the resolution for this was they moved everything into Google. And so now the tool chain is consistent. Still a lot to learn, but it's at least a consistent tool chain. For me, attempt number two was let's try this at Dropbox. Let's see what happens here. Um, we had a very similar stack. Dropbox has its own physical infrastructure. Amazon has a bunch of things that we used to use. Um, so block storage was there. They had block of front ends. All the databases and web front ends were in our infrastructure. This is where it gets interesting because we talked about that big storage migration before. So we ended up with this. We said, okay, we're gonna move all the storage systems in Magic Pocket to us. We're gonna do EU block storage because it can't go away because we've gotta handle GDPR and all these other things for geo-replication. So we have some storage still there. There's actually other infrastructure there as well, but for the most part, that's like the big chunky things. And you're kind of looking at this like, okay, well now how do I manage this, right? Because we have tens of megawatts of power and space we're managing ourselves. We have very large, like say, like, 
tens to hundreds of millions of dollars of AWS bills coming in as well. So this is not like you can manage this as like, okay, this is, I can assign two people to manage Amazon and it'll just be fine. You actually have to figure out how to reconcile this tool chain. And I think that if you're in multi-cloud today, you're probably starting to face a lot of these challenges as teams are doing split brain things and there's a lot of cognitive overhead for it. This was our attempt. We said, okay, let's build a single interface. Let's make it really easy. We'll give one command line tool that everyone can use and we'll wrap everything. Um, I haven't looked enough at Azure DevOps, but I'm guessing this is like sort of their approach at, at this point right now. A bunch of pluggable things that goes into a one command line tool and it like sort of fans its way out in the back. So we built something called MDB uh, Machine Database, which is more of like a service database, to be honest. Um, where you could have a web server or a server, you could add a tag to it, and this is sort of like what it would take on and the persona it would take on. Um, nothing crazy here, we'd say okay, and we give it an owner tag, this is the owner of it. Um, where it becomes interesting though is when we did things like this, we did a reinstall. Well, the service owner really didn't want to deal with reinstalls or kernel upgrades or anything fundamental to the system and it became a problem because they're like, oh, we don't know anything about this, we don't want to deal with like fault tolerance, we don't want to handle any of these things. Yes, I get it, Kubernetes makes it a little better now, but I don't think it's like a panacea. Um, so like this app team is sitting here going, well I own this thing, and really I only care about the web server, I don't really care about anything about your underlying things, right? Hence how we get to serverless today. And we have a platform team going, well I need to reinstall that thing because I need to patch the kernel. And so this just ends up this like coordination nightmare around people trying to like convince the other team that their the thing they're trying to do this week is more important. You have TPMs running around scheduling um, and uh, I will stand here and tell you like we got this entirely wrong. Um, I think that there's, you know, hindsight being 2020, I think Netflix, and I'm gonna walk through this now, Netflix came up with a much better pattern for this. Um, and they have a blog out there called manage. it's on a website called manage.delivery, I'll have them in the end, um, where they talk about how to separate this in a little bit more elegant way. And I'll walk you through that right now. Um, so you have a person, right, that typically just wants to ship code. They don't care about anything else. And so when they start, they have something that looks pretty simple. They're just like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, out of GitHub Actions or whatever, I'm just gonna push my thing, and it's gonna go to the staging environment, production environment, I'm call it a day. Like, they may not even having two environments, like just maybe just one. They're like, this is easy. And then somebody shows up, um, call it, the uh, DevOps person, the SRE, somebody in the organization shows up and says like, well we need SLAs, right? Because like this thing now has user traffic on it, we can't just like let it sit there. Well who has these SLAs? Is it, like, like the DevOps person? Is it the, yeah, like is it the, is it the, um, is it the software engineer that stood this thing up? Either way, right, you end up with like, okay now we're gonna start getting config bloat and like everyone's like, I don't understand what the other person was intending to do here because I'm just trying to add my SLAs and they're like, well I'm just trying to deploy code. Um, so now you have this like competing priorities. Well, it gets even more interesting because the compliance team shows up and told the infrastructure people, well, we need another region because we need to have that thing for GDPR and we need to go there because the sales team wants it. Or I'm guessing, has anybody dealt with like tenancy problems where they like, show up and say, I want to run n numbers of copies of this because like our enterprise customers want these things. So it's the other one, variation of this, right? And so now you've got this like massive configuration file for deployment that's super hard to understand. Um, I just like squinting at this here, I'm like, there's a bunch of templating and there's probably a bunch of esoteric things that no one really understands what the intent was originally um, six months, a year later. I would love to live in a world where like everyone does what they do best <laughs> and we can split this up in a much, much more clean way. And this is what Netflix proposes. Um, the Spinnaker project actually has this under a subheading called Managed Delivery and they run a project called Keel, which I think is being developed still inside of Netflix, but doesn't take a lot of commits back out from what I can tell. Um, they separate this. They move to a much more declarative model where infrastructure and delivery rules are set up once and applied to everyone. So service owners never actually have to think about them. They're just mapped automatically through a compiler to back down to it. And so if you, this one is a, it's still not like super clean on the, this screen, but if you look at it, basically what we're, what we're saying here is that there's an environment called production. It has to, uh, its precondition is that staging must be stable. How we talk about sta staging being stable is not introduced in this file. It's just staging has to be stable because that's the requirement. Um, and it's got a rule that says it's not the weekend. Right, that's, and now we, we can understand the intent of this. Production has to follow staging, it has, and it can't be the weekend. 
And we also can extract the, infra ex extract the infrastructure. We're not talking about what type of cluster or anything like that. We're just saying there's a runtime called production US on Cades. Could it easily be in production US ECS or Lambda or whatever else, right? Now the infrastructure person can manage their portion of this and we're bridging this together here at delivery time. This is just infrastructure to delivery, business rules plus the baseline. And then they propose, let's move this out to separate infrastructure from service. Let's have the infrastructure people deal with the bottom layer, layer and the delivery teams write delivery rules because that's what they're responsible for. They're responsible for the delivery of the thing. And then the service teams just need to worry about like the basics of their application. How many replicas, what's the image, like what code is going on. It's like it, it, we remove the cognitive overhead and we join this at, at deploy time, right? We can put a compiler in place here effectively to figure out what the dependency tree looks like. Um, and so this much more declarative mode, right? We have what were three pieces now, and what happens is, is we actually join these and we build a desired state out of this, as opposed to having three, some imperative configuration that's like if this, then this, and all these different regions. We can write this once and then map this back into a single desired state. And so what we've learned, and I've learned this through sort of looking at the Netflix folks, and I think Dropbox towards the end of my tenure, we move towards this. Um, we found that declarative scales way better, um, way, way better from a, from a developer standpoint. And Kube has a lot of these properties. The problem is, is it's not mapped universally through the organization across all the various pieces of infrastructure you have. Um, and so bridging this all together, it's not a desired state of everything. It's just like little tiny slivers today. And so what we were striving for at Dropbox is to like figure out a way to bring this all together. I think Netflix actually has done a very good job of doing this, about bringing a bunch of these pieces together in one place. Okay, so now we've solved the baseline infrastructure problem, right? We've said like infrastructure as code is good. We've now also, so we can deploy that. We've said like, okay, let's build declarative states. That's, that's a step up from where we were how, managing pipelines and trying to get everyone and figure out what's happening and it's like codified in a TPM, uh, codified in a TPM's head or a lease manager's head that's trying to figure out what's the next person I talk to to make sure these rules happen. I mean, for me when I was at YouTube, we had every single person in the engineering team would get on IRC when we did a deployment. We had probably two to 300 engineers and they would sit there and a TPM would run through 200 line spreadsheet. We'd each validate whatever we're gonna do and that process could take days. And so like as we added engineers, as we added these things, like it just scaled, like the deploy times just went, kept going up and up and up and up. Um, we went from like being able to deploy daily to like weekly and it was just, it was very, very painful. Um, had we had something like this, it would have drastically changed sort of the game for us in terms of like where we could actually have asked teams to interface with. Um, the next lesson, and I think this is probably what the farthest from where I see the world today, this is my personal view on this, is that um, we still live in a world where there's a lot of uh, belief that like production is a static thing, that if I set these rules, it'll never change. And I have this like data center and I'm gonna put my things in this data center and that's gonna be good. Um, let me ask you this, who here manages uh, more than one system? Okay, every, okay, this is easy. More than two systems? <laughs> Gonna, okay, so all the hands are gonna stay up. Uh, anything more than five systems? Okay, so uh, everyone manages distributed systems now at this point, right? Like that is, that is a constant. Um, let's just assume like the cloud is a distributed system at this point. Um, everything crosses boundaries now. There's no more, okay, I have my application, I'm gonna put it on a server and I'm, this is gonna be my thing with my, with my PHP app and my MySQL thing and that's all it's gonna be. It is a distributed system. Which means that everything crosses boundaries. And as much as I would love to live in a world that's like Amazon where everybody has to have interfaces that are well defined and everything can break at any given point in time, I'm guessing no one here really lives in that world. Yeah, it is. <laughs> like, it, pragmatically, right, like we don't know the dependencies we take um, in a lot of cases. So I, I, I would postulate that control is an illusion for most people. Like we want to have this control, but maybe another way of thinking about it is like, what if we just gave up the control? What if we didn't actually try to have all the control we to exercise across the system? Um, and here, here's the reasons why. For service dependencies, in your own infrastructure, do, does this group feel like they have pretty good understanding of their service dependencies? Or like 50-50? Okay, one, yes. No, I saw it. Like, I'm guessing if I said like enumerate all your dependencies, people would have a problem doing that today. Um, 
That's just in your infrastructure. Do you know your cloud dependencies? Like what, dep like for example, do people know that like EC2 and S3 are, n are not a, not a non-blocking switching fabric? Meaning that like you can overload that and I have been in an environment where we've overloaded that. That's a dependency. Like we need to know that in order for us to try to copy X bytes of data out through, S through EC2 instances. It will break. So there are underlying fundamental cloud assumptions there that you fundamentally can't know at this point. Um, just in the hardware world, right, maybe you can get, you can go pretty low, but in the cloud you can't. It's, you know, there's abstraction layer, abstraction layer, abstraction layer. And so you have dependencies you don't even know about. And the last one is, uh, how many people have application teams deploying apps that take SAS dependencies? Anybody have this? Okay. Um, do you know when your SaaS providers are doing upgrades or changing things? Okay, so, yeah. um, so this is complete illusion now, right? How many of you even know which new dependencies the app teams take on SaaS providers? I'm guessing that's also a very low number. Security may have a better view, but like, the, it's, no, okay. <laughs> so like, it, it's hard, right? So like, the best you can do is defend the thing you have, right? You can't actually try to enumerate the dependencies and manage it that way, right? Like, we're just gonna assume that failure is gonna occur and so we, now we have to adapt to like what when failure when failure happens. So okay, we're all aligned. Co change is constant in the cloud. Now let's get to like deployments. Um, pipelines are really bad with change. <laughs> um, pipelines are like probably like it goes in one direction. It's a singularly linked list in a lot of, in, it, 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 from that perspective. Um, let's like look at an example of this. This is a deployment pipeline. Okay, it's going to go out like that, right? This is the steady state best case that can possibly happen. How many of you have had this scenario where, let's say, Production US just decides to blow up? What do you do? Do you roll back? Do you fix Production US, like, out of band to get it to keep going? Do you go and, I don't even know, like, start a new pipeline just for Production US and then, like, stop, cancel this? Like, okay, this is now, like, it's hard to reason about as an operator. Put yourself in the application or the intern's shoes. What does the intern do? They have zero clue how to handle this problem, right? Like, so we're building systems that are like not feasible for people at like the higher altitude here. So this is painful and slow. Um, we can take a lesson from open source world, from Netflix, from a bunch of places. Uh, convergence engines are a thing. People use these. They are not. They adapt thing to real time change. Uh, you can set desired states, say and then have an engine try to bring you to that desired state, exactly the way Kube does this. What if you could do this like everywhere instead of just inside of the one place called Kubernetes? That's been the sort of what Netflix has promised with Keel and a bunch of what they've built in managed delivery in Spinnaker. Um, it's not a panacea, right, but like it takes you way farther because you can take that same system, right, the same, uh, same failed mode here, and now you can resume, right? If something happens, you can resume there, you can pause, you can do all kinds of interesting things. And if you think back to the, I should have put a slide here, if you think back to the declared states of like how the environments work, parallelism now becomes easy also. Because if you understand the dependency tree, you can unwind this dependency tree, right? And you can say, I can actually, I, I didn't actually say in any point in this conversation that like these things had to go in that order. <laughs> the pipeline just made them go in that order because that's how we wrote this thing. But in a lot of cases, it may not have been actually that's what I wanted, right? It was just like, it by coincidence happened that way. Let's make this a little bit more complicated because now cloud systems are way more complicated than our previous lives were. Let's consider this use case. We're gonna roll from version one to version three. This is what happens today, right? This is what your probably your normal deployment pipelines are gonna look like. We're assuming like one day of one day per release, it's called a storage system or something like that. It, time scale doesn't really matter. This is just to like to be helpful here. Um, the first observation is like it's going to be it's going to take one per thing. The next observation, right, is that staging is blocked from taking a new update from a new commit, right? Like you can't continually update staging in this model. Like, unless you break its dependency on the production, e like, it becomes very hard to reason about this really fast. And it's not super fast. Like, now let's put this through a model where, like, we understand the dependencies, and we understand the, how, in a convergence model, you could make it look more like this. 
So you're at 50% of your time to deploy also. So this is the best case, right? You can, somewhere between seven and 15 is probably where you're gonna land, depending on your dependency tree. But you can actually, this becomes way more powerful, right? You can get a much more simple language, much more simple configuration. By giving the engine the ability to reason about it, the engine can actually figure out what is actually gonna roll out in what order. Um, and you're now in a place where you can adapt to real time issues as well, right? Because you have a desired state, you can go through this desired state, you're replacing this, this notion of it has to be linear with a notion that like it's gonna happen real time all the time. Um, so whatever circuit breakers you need, all of that gets, can be put in, in line with it. Okay, so my takeaway here is convergence is way better or some type of uh, adaptable engine is way, way better um, for, uh, for, production, for production systems in the cloud. I'm running a little fast on this, so I will make sure we save some time for Q&A. So let's put this together. Um, I like to think of like modern intent-based delivery systems. I think we're on a place where the current, and here's my, this, I'll summarize the argument is this. When we did lift and shift to the cloud, the tool chains did not evolve. We lifted and shifted intentionally because the variable we were trying to control was physical infrastructure to cloud infrastructure. And so we effectively moved things from point A to point B with the exact same tool chain we had prior. But we've agreed that change is constant now in the cloud and things are like, the, we can't control the dependency tree the way we could, used to think we could control it in, a physical in the physical environments. So now we actually have to go back, right? Like this is what we had to do when we built storage systems is we had to go back to first principles and say like, what are we gonna do now that we have this thing that we moved here very quickly, which is manufactured growth. How do we manage that thing in this new environment? We haven't actually gone through that journey yet. We're just starting it. I think infrastructure as code was the very beginning of this. Um, and now we're in a world where like, what is the next generation of things of next generation of a uh, deployment type of things look like? So the first is separation of responsibilities. Like we need to find to be in a world where service teams can define how apps were managed, how infra can define how infra is managed, and we need a way to move that out to production environments without those two teams blocking each other, right? Infrastructure is a complicated problem now. It's way more complicated than it was 15 or 20 years ago. So now we need to have, those teams need to be able to handle that stuff independently. Um, a good example is like the, who had to deal with the log4j bug? Security, okay, one hand going up. Oh, everyone knows the log4j, so what if you could upgrade everything independently without the service teams even worrying about it? Like most systems today, it's very hard to do. Um, I don't think Kube even gets to that level of like, how do we solve that problem? Those are the class of problems that infra teams and security teams are faced with now, right? Like that's the class of problem and they don't have the ability to like understand what's happening off stack. So there is a separation of responsibilities and interface that needs to be there. I would say declarative, I, you basically, this idea of desired states um, is way more powerful than sort of like the if else's that we have in the current sort of uh, CI world, uh, CI systems. I would also say that like your CI system probably should not be your deployment system at this point. Um, it's way more complicated than just point A to point B. We're not printing gold master CDs anymore. We're actually doing deploying distributed system. Um, I think the other one is uh, adapts to real time change. Again, if we are deploying gold master CDs, there is no change, right? We print a physical thing, so a pipeline kind of makes sense. We get one artifact at the end, that artifact is shipped out to everybody's computer. I worked at AOL, so like I, I, like I feel like I can say this. <laughs> we, we, we had a CD and we shipped it. That, 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 that artifact is very different than the artifact we're shipping today. Um, and so I think that, that necessitates a change in how we think about delivery. And I think you also have to abstract infrastructure. I don't think there's a world where infrastructure um, can leak the way it's been leaking up stack today um, for a bunch of reasons. One, I don't think it lets people do what they do best. Again, the intern problem. I think that it's way more complicated than people realize. Uh, we've lost, we've spent more time on app side the last five years than we have on the infra side in like sort of the, the general computing world. Um, and that's causing, there's friction there. Um, and then I think the other one is that you want, if cost is a thing, you need the levers, you need the ability to control cost at supply and demand level, and this is a whole different talk, but I think of infra as a supply side, 
and uh, applications as demand side. And so you want to be able to control both of those cost levers. One of those allows you to reduce sort of like the computing costs, and one of those is about like how many users are coming onto it. And if you don't have that abstraction, that also removes uh, your ability to control costs. And so effectively margins if you're sort of the enterprise level. Um, this is roughly the architecture of both what we built and also what Spinnaker uh, has could have done, where you can kind of con combine these things. You end up with basically compiled, you compile down to desired state, desired state is handed to an engine. The engine can then fetch and runs fetch and applies against things um, to get them to their current state. It is very, very different than what the current pipeline model, so it changes the reasoning of this room more so than anyone else. Upstream is actually easier to reason about, in my experience. The downstream infrastructure teams generally don't care. <laughs> uh, they actually have a way easier world in like a lot of ways, because they, they don't have people coming and asking them questions anymore. Um, so uh, let's see, at the top, right, this is like let, get our requirements together, and then we take them, um, we, we build a desired state, calculate the changes, and then at the bottom layer here, um, we fetch the current state of your environment, we say like, okay, what's happening? And then we can compare that to your state that you want, and then we can apply changes, right? Like, and you can make this kind of a loop happen, um, which is a way more powerful construct than, uh, than what we have with pipelines. So I will finish. I came here, if they don't tell me and I will send them out in some way, shape or form, um, or you can just go to the URLs. Uh, the first one is basically how we took um, a four to six million line Python monolith and broke it apart into a serverless framework with a lot of the same delivery principles. Netflix is wrote a bunch on managed delivery. We just wrote some blog posts on this as well. Um, I would say the managed delivery team has like since scattered across the, the uh, the, the sort of industry, but I think I've been spending a bunch of time with them recently and they feel very, like they have a bunch of case studies also around sort of why this, why, what they've seen in the wild with this. I think like Samsung Smart Things uses this as like their, uh, their default delivery mechanism at this point. Um, so I will pause there for questions. Um, also we can have lunch, yes. No, 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 I was gonna say, or we can go have lunch. Uh, yes, go, go ahead. It be, my philosophy on this is that the, you probably want to handle it at environment level, not necessarily just service level. And so there's like, you want to have a reason, a building block you can reason about. And so going down to like the, depends on the layer of minutia um, that you're talking about. I think for environment, it's fairly easy. You can say like this constraint is this environment must get to this level. For storage systems, which is my example here, very easy. We actually wanted different versions everywhere for storage because you never want to have the bug that deletes everything in, that, in all regions simultaneously. So we would have like, and you have data vintages and you have a whole other set of problems. So in that case, actually we wanted it to look like that. We wanted that problem. Um, I think generally, the deep, I think, on the other axis, right, like deployment axis, and I'm increasing complexity of sort of reasoning here. I think on the other axis, like the telemetry teams are getting way better at that. And so that, I think those two things put you in a different quadrant now. So if you assume old tech on all portions, yeah, I think it could be a problem. But yeah, I think you have to up level these things. I, I don't think you should up level one without doing others and other <laughs> these type of things. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to like who knows what it'll look like in like fifteen years, where like there is an end user and you can't just hand them the data to like assume it's fixed. Do you think there's a place for like Spinnaker? Or like do you have an opinion of like like is there a place to model and like automatically updating the model rate is so inefficient that there's no real application side. Like is there a reason for design or like who owns what process? Okay, so the question is who owns what process is where are the lines? Um I think that you know every team I've ever managed 
I had a concept of like, um, at a very coarse level, serving path versus non-serving path, that's like super easy to draw, like batch versus not batch. Then you get into the core libraries versus not core libraries. Um, for my teams and my philosophy, it's very hard, like some of this is, doesn't translate well. We, I believe in one of, not n of. So one RPC system, one version of everything effectively. And so then rules around how fast you have to converge to said version. Um, and so the answer to that is like, I'm sort of sidestepping your question by saying like there's gonna be a layer at which like this stuff has to go out and you're going to do this and there's like a very small set of people that control that um, and then there's like everything else sprawl on top of that. Um, I, in this model, I would put this on build side, on the build side. Um, you know what's going out, and so you can keep a catalog of that, and so you can kind of put the back pressure to say like, okay, these things need to get in a certain place. The way we handled this in my previous lives, where we would actually put different gates on, like they end up being human gates. When I say human gates, human back pressure gates. Making it painful for them to do something else until they update. Then you're talking about like, make it less painful to update. So I think of it as like build system of what I want the end state to be and then automate those individual pieces. I actually don't, not very strongly opinionated about what tech is gonna have to happen where. It's just gonna be what is the human, how does that pain for the human be very low? Um, so in my previous life, build system team would have handled this. They would have made sure that we would have had some sort of report deploys would have been blocked if that you weren't at a certain level. Um, and then if you weren't actually if your services were not deployed within 30 days, we started sending pages to you. If we're opening tickets, then we started sending pages to you. It didn't matter what time of day it was. Like, that, you know, this is the thing. So we'd open a sev or something like that against the team and use that organizational construct as like back pressure. Um, I don't think there's a clean way that I've seen yet to do this. Server somewhere, server somewhere has gonna have to, is, it's gonna have, yeah, yeah. Oh, convergence better than pipeline. Uh, convergence engine is gonna handle real time things where pipeline is gonna statically move in one direction. So you can't really make a pipeline go backwards. It's another pipeline at that point. Um, and convergence typically runs in a loop. Think of it that way, it's pulling constantly. Uh, and so let's say you see a failure, you know how to, you can, you can respond to that failure real time without just like the pipeline stopping. Cool, I think we're at time. All right, well, we are at time. Thank you so much.